get in our Bibles for a little bit, have a little time of prayer, and a little We're going to be in the book of John this evening. I'm going to pick up where I left off on the uh, sermon I preached last Sunday on the last of his earthly ministry, speaking of the Lord's earthly ministry. And uh, I preached out of John 13. We'll be in uh, 15 is where we'll be at tonight, the end of 14, first to 15. But uh, I preached on his last message. I dealt with the last message that he gave there in John chapter number 13. Uh, talked about the example of his service. Verse 15, the exposure of the sellout, which was Judas. Verse 18, uh, the enlightenment of his sovereignty. In verse 19, the effective sonship. Verse 35. Chapter 14, verse 16, we dealt with the entrance of the Spirit of God. And tonight we're going we're gonna to pick up on his last mile, the last mile in the Lord's life uh, here on the earth before the crucifixion. I'm aware that he come back after the crucifixion and was among the brethren 40 days and uh, 50 days and, and, and was around and done a ministry there. But I'm talking about prior to the Crucifixion. So we're John chapter number 14. And our text verse will be verse number 31. And then we're going to cover 15, 16, 17, 18 tonight. So we got the boogie, right? Amen. All right. Verse 14 says, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so... I do. Arise, let us go hence. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you again that you'd help me tonight, that you'd touch us and fill us with your power. Use us with our spirit and the word of God tonight. Stir our hearts. Encourage us through thy word. Wash us and make us clean through thy word. Forgive us where we've sinned and come short. Lord, minister to those in great need, those in bereavement, those in sickness. Uh, Lord, those that need a special touch, you know each of those, and we pray that you be with them tonight. Help us, I do humbly pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, I read that verse because verse 31 ends with the phrase, arise and let us go. And where I'm, where I'm looking at here is the Lord is taking the last mile of his journey as he heads to Calvary, and I'm going to deal with that thought just a little bit. Where is he arising from? It's good to be a questionnaire. When you look at stuff and you see something, you read it, it's good to ask questions because you can learn from asking questions. Uh, a lot of teachers in class with a student with the right spirit asking questions, they like it because that's what they signed up for to teach. So when students are concerned and asking questions, uh, it, it encourages the teacher. So I ask the question, arise and let us go hence. Where are they arising from? Well, if you back up a few pages, you're going to find out where he was at when all this has taken place, and that was in Bethany. Remember, he was there in chapter 12, chapter 11 and 12. He went home with them and had supper with them there at uh, uh, Lazarus's house, I believe. He had a, a, a sister named Martha and a sister named Mary. They had the supper there, the anointing of his feet. All these things took place there. And then we dealt with his message that he gave them at Bethany. And we come over now to chapter 14 leading into chapter 15. And we'll see some things that took place on the last mile of the journey in the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. The last mile did not begin in the hearts of those angry soldiers, nor in the heart of evil Judas. The last mile began in, began in the heart of God before the foundation of the world. 
See, what's astounding to me is God knew everything before it took place, and he still wanted to do so. He knew the battle. He knew the problems. He knew the, the rejections. He knew the pain that was awaiting him, yet he chose to walk this mile for us, for the sins of all mankind. Revelation 13, 8 says, The lame, the, uh, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In the heart of God, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain before he ever made the foundations of the world. God had a plan. Aren't we foolish to sometimes think that we can mess up God's plan? You know, I, I understand folks can get out of God's will. That means God's got a better plan. Rather than you taking a wrong road or wrong route, God's got a better plan. Uh, but oftentimes folks will do that. But God's got a plan that it's a good plan. And uh, there's blessings and promises on the road that God has for us to walk. Here the Lord says to his disciples, uh, rise and let us go hence. He's telling them it's time for us to get up and go. Uh, there's a journey ahead of us that we must embark upon to complete the will of God. Now as he starts this last mile, even out of Bethany, his next stop is going to be in Gethsemane. We'll look at that in just a few moments. But I want you to highlight some things as we go through probably sort of like survey tonight because there's no way, uh, you know, the time don't allow for us to read all of the chapters that's uh, in this little study tonight. But chapter 15, I want you to notice as you just, you can read fast or uh, 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 scan that if you will. Uh, might have a speed reader in the group, I don't know. But chapter 15, verses 1 through 8 there the Lord begins to address that He's the vine, He's of the Father, and every branch that is in Him that beareth not fruit, take it, the Father taketh away, and then those that remain, He prunes them. Uh, he talks about making them, He purges them, making them profitable. Sometimes we go through some surgical work of Almighty God that cuts off some old dead limbs, helps us to grow like we're supposed to. You purge it. And uh, it causes it to grow. I don't, I don't tend to my grapevines like I'm supposed to. You're supposed to trim them things up uh, once a year. And I don't, I don't get that done every time. And in doing so, it makes them produce better. Sometimes things that are painful to us are very productive to our lives. Some things, some things need to be cut off or cut out of your life so that you can be what you should be for the glory of God. So he talks to them about remaining fruitful in verse 1 through 8. He talks to them about real love in verses 9 through 14 and again in verse number 17. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And he goes on and he tells us to love others as he's loved us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends in verse number 13. And ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command. And, and he goes on and on, and he tells us again in verse 17, These things I command you, that ye love one another. So oftentimes in our preaching, we talk about things we shouldn't do, and, and we talk about we shouldn't be a, a drunkard, and we shouldn't steal, and we shouldn't lie, we shouldn't kill, all these various sins that's ugly but it's also a sin to break God's command, and His command is that we love one another. I've got the cure to the world's problems if they would obey it. That's just follow what the Lord teaches right there. Love one another. Love one another like you love yourself. Love one another like Jesus loves you. That's the example that we should follow. So he talks to them as he educates them in joy. He talks about how to remain fruitful, how to, uh, what real love is. He talks in verse 15 about the relationship. Him, henceforth, uh, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. 
The Lord, the Lord is taking this discipleship into a more intimate realm. He's letting them know that, hey, listen, we're friends. We're more than just uh, I'm Lord and your servant. He, he, yes, we are to serve, but he wants us, he wants us his friends. Amen. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother, as the proverb tells us. So we need, we need that friendship. Friendship is folks that, that walk hand in hand. They overlook one another's faults. Of course, he has no faults for us to overlook, but we have a bunch he overlooks. And we, we, we love each other. We help each other. We're there for one another in spite of little mishaps and problems that goes along. You know, it's, it's a, I used to hear them talk about if you have five real friends in your life, you're very blessed. I used to think back in school days, man, I got a bunch of friends till trouble comes. Then you find out who the real friends is. Oh, buddy, you need something? Just give me a call. You call and they don't answer. You find out who your real friends is when you get down and out and you need somebody. You laid on your back and you can't get up. You got uh, immobilized. You had to stay in a chair for three months. You find out who real friends are. I've been around those things. Dad was sick and we was down and out. Folks come through. I had I had a lot of good folks come through. Some of them was coming through because they was his friends. But I got to enjoy friends because they was friends to my father. There's a lot of folks I've got to enjoy in this life because they're friends with my heavenly father. They made me feel like family. They've introduced me to their homes and, and put me up and took care of me just like I belong there. You know, it's amazing. You can go to a different church across the country. Uh, like a uh, uh, brother was here Sunday. Brother Bush, he was here Sunday. He just feels at home here. Well, he's supposed to. He is at home. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We got the same father. Y'all to feel at home at, at your father's house. Amen. Amen. I don't have to ask nobody else what I can do at my father's house. I never one time went in my dad's house and asked Miss Judy what I could do. No. I was at daddy's house. I could, I could, I could do whatever I know my daddy's rules permitted. Amen. So he educates them in joy. The reason I use that joy because he, he tells them in verse number 11, the key to this thing is verse number 11, he wants them to, he said, I spoke these things, or these things have I spoken unto you that my, jo uh, my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Jesus Christ wants you to be joyful. He wants you in spite of problems, ups and downs, heartaches, he wants you to know what real joy is. Remember what he said in Hebrews, or what it said in Hebrews about the Lord, said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Going through all of this that we'll study over the next few days and read over the next few days about the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, the pain, the suffering that he went through, he went through it with joy. See, the joy is, 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 he remained fruitful during this thing. He knowed what, uh, knows what real love is. He's got a relationship with his disciples. And then verse number 16, the last part of that, he tells us to ask whatsoever we ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He talks to us. He shows us what our requests are to be. We're to call on the Father. He wants us talking to the Father and asking for the things that we need. Latter part of verse 16. But he also knows what rejection is because when you look at verse 18 through 25, he talks about how that the world hated him. And they should because they're not the same. They're of the devil. The world, when he speaks of the world crowd, he's talking about those that are not saved, those that are not sons, those that are not saints, those that are not servants. He's talking about the Satan crowd. Listen, the bottom line is folks are saved or they're lost. They either know the Lord Jesus Christ personally through salvation or they do not. Uh, the acquaintance is not good enough to go to heaven on. Just because you know about the Lord, you know about the Bible, you know about heaven, uh, that's wonderful, but that's not going to take you to heaven. The only thing that will take you to heaven is sonship. 
You must come to a place in your life that you realize you're a sinner and he went to Calvary for you. It's hot. It ain't on. I'm sorry. So when you, when you, study, when you study what Jesus went through, the walk that he takes, look at verses 18 through 25. Verses 18 through 25 tells us about the walk of the Lord. Verse 18 through 25 shows how he walked in this world. And while walking in this world, he had to deal with the rejection of the very ones that he would die for. Boy, doesn't that sound terrible? He come to die for people that want absolutely nothing to do with him. Absolutely nothing. They, 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 like, they don't mind to talk a little bit once in a while, but they don't want to be real Christians. They don't want to be involved in real church. I, I got the question for them. Why do they want to go to a real heaven? If you don't love Jesus and the things of Jesus, why do you want to go to his home? Hey, listen, all of these rules and regulations that's going on right here is there. And every single one to perfection is obeyed. You know what happens to folks that, that uh, which can't happen again, it's already took place, but you know what happened when folks didn't like the way things was going in heaven? They got kicked out. His name was Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And those angels that thought they could stand up with him, that he fooled into standing with him, they went too. And God took that bunch, wrapped them up in chains, and put them in hell. That's where they are. Those angels that stood against God with the devil are in hell in chains. Now Satan is going to and fro trying to get him up a, a mob of folks to stand against God in the end battle. And we already read the end of it. We already know before it gets here because God knows what's going to take place. God told us what's going to take place. And those on God's side is going to come out a winner. Amen. Amen. So he educates them in joy. Even though we have to go through rejection, understand why we're being rejected. We're being rejected because we received Christ. We're being rejected because we want to walk like, talk like, act like Jesus. Amen? I listened to them on the radio today, and they was talking about some of the things that went on there in Nashville with that shooting in the school, and, and, and they was talking about the, uh, the church. Y'all know that the, the uh, Southern Baptist Church Convention headquarters is in Nashville. Did y'all see any of those folks in any of that news media concerning those six folks that died? And that was what they was talking about on the radio, that the church folks needs to get out of the closet, needs to get out of the hiding place. We need to come to the forefront and let folks know what Christ is all about. Amen. Not, you ain't got to be ugly and rude, and I'm not telling you to go fight. I'm telling you to stand with a heart of love and let them know our answers in Jesus. The answer for this, this crime-stricken world is Jesus. I, I don't know when the last time I stole a cookie. But I'm telling you tonight, it's been many, many long years since this boy stole anything. It ain't because I reformed. It's because I was regenerated. It ain't because I turned over a new leaf. I got hooked up with a new tree. It's a whole different vine he starts off chapter 15 with. So there, there's a much, much difference in our living when we get hooked up with Jesus than what the world does. So he goes through that uh, rejection in verses 18 through 25. Then he talks to him as, as he's traveling on his last mile. Now, now think about how important this is. This is his last mile with them, y'all. He starts out educating them in joy because you're going to need some joy to carry you through the hard nights, the troubled times. Because if you don't have joy, you'll quit. 
You can't understand it. You don't have to. You can't explain it. You don't have to. Just enjoy it. That even though the world seems to be falling apart around you and it looks like you can't go on another day, there's something inside you that says it's going to be worth it all when it's over. I've been rehearsing a little bit now in the office today that, that song on the last mile. I was going to get in here and get it looked up, and I didn't get it looked up yet. But when I go on the last mile of my journey, you know, one of these days it's going to be our last mile. I hope that I can be as Jesus and, and, and try to educate folks in how it is to be happy. Some folks are going to have to work on that because you ain't happy now. You don't have joy now. You need to get your joy revived. Amen. Yeah, we got troubles and trials and tribulations that we go through, but at least we're saved and going to heaven. And we have the opportunity through it all to tell others about Jesus Christ that will save them regardless of who they are or where they come from. What a Savior. So he goes on into chapter 16. You know chapter 16. In chapter 16... Instead of educating them on joy as 15, he goes into 16 and he gives them emphasis on the comforter. What he's saying to them is, I'm going away, but have no fear. I'm going to give you a comforter. Even though you're going to have a void of me being with you, I'm going to give you somebody that's going to make it up. I, I, I don't want to over emphasize on Miss Shirley tonight, but she has spoken many times testifying how good God's been to her in the void of losing her dear mate. Somehow or another, the Holy Ghost has given her comfort and grace and kept her going. That's what he's talking about, children. He'll give us the comforter to help us that when we don't think we're going to make it, when we don't think we can go on, he gives us a comforter that pushes us forward. Comforter comes in with many things to do. He talks about how that they're going to throw him out of the synagogue as he opens up chapter 16. That happens. You get to tell them the truth. They're going to shut you up somehow or another. They don't like truth. Remember the devil's a liar, the father of it. John chapter 8 tells you that, but you've got proof of it in Genesis in the garden. He lied to Eve and caused her to sin against God. Then Adam willfully, because she sinned, sinned with her. Gives us a picture of Jesus, willingly, knowingly, partook of a sin for her sake. Jesus took on our sin. He didn't commit sin, but he took on my sin for my sake. Paid the price. So we see the emphasis on the comforter. Verses 11, uh, 7 through 11, he talks about how the comforter is going to come and he's going to, he's going to rebuke the world, reprove the world of sin. That's the job of the Holy Ghost. He'll comfort the saved, the serving. But he's going to bring discomfort to those that's not where they need to be. He's going to reprove the world of sin. That's what he's supposed to do. Of sin, because they believe not. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father. Of judgment, because of the prince of this world is judged. So he comes in rebuking sin. That's the Holy Ghost work. That's why you can have God show up in His Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, whatever label you want to put on Him. He's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Several different titles, same person. He shows up in a service and somebody over here is getting comfort and God bumps us all over them and they're enjoying Jesus and over here on the other side or in the middle or somewhere, he's working on another and giving them conviction. That's the Holy Ghost. That's what he's supposed to do. If there's sin there, he's to bring conviction on it. If there's worship going on, he encourages and gives them a little extra juice to go with it. Amen. That's the, that's the Holy Ghost. He is the resources for saved folk. When you look at verses uh, 13 through 15, he's going to guide us in truth. He says there in verse 13, 
And that's where I got a little problem with some folk. How do they how do they get so far off when the Holy Ghost of God is there to guide in truth? <coughs> One or two things going on. They don't know the Holy Ghost at all. Or they've quenched and grieved the Holy Ghost and he's letting them go on and, uh, and uh, rough days are coming. One of two things. Because the scripture teaches us that he comes forth and he has purpose in his coming. Comfort and guidance. He guides us in truth. But he's there for a certain time. When you look, when you look at verse 16, Jesus says to him on his journey. Now we're walking. Jesus is walking his last mile. <coughs> he's, headed, he's heading to the Garden of Gethsemane. Where they're going to take him in. To the judgment hall. He's on his last year. And what he's telling these guys is so important because this is his last time walking with them in that manner. And he says, hey, guys, listen. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter is coming. And he's going he's gonna to guide you in truth. And he's going to be here for those times. He says, verse 16, for yet a little while, uh, and you shall not see me again. And in a little while, and you shall see me because I go to my Father. <clears throat> they begin to murmur and talk around themselves about what's going on there, what's he really meaning. He says, do you inquire, verse 19, do you inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and you shall see, shall not see me in a little while, and you shall see me? Verily I say unto you <coughs> that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. It's amazing how quick this is going to happen. Because in just a little bit, in the Garden of Gethsemane, they're going to take the Lord in for trial. And they're going to weep. The disciples will weep. They will lament. They're going to go through a sorrowful time. And all the way to the time Jesus dies on Calvary, these disciples is going to be in much sorrow. Because their leader, <clears throat> their Savior, their dear friend of three and a half years is going to be crucified. The world's rejoicing. They're all happy. They're joyful that Christ has been crucified. The sad thing is, is the religious crowd as well, well as the wicked crowd was rejoicing on the day that Jesus was crucified because it was the chief priest that put them all up to it. It was the chief priest that said, Jesus, give us Barabbas. The religious crowd had the main hand in crucifying Jesus. <coughs> so we see that the Holy Ghost is here for these times, for their problems in verse 19 through 22. He's going to be with them. He tells them in verse 22, and yet now, uh, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. And your joy no man taketh from you. God gave us something on top of our salvation that mankind can't take from us. They can take a lot from us. We can be sitting in ashes as Job was, but there's a joy down in our heart. Because we know Jesus. And when this world's over, we're going to be with him forevermore. There's a joy in our soul to know that God in heaven in spite of my wicked sins, forgave me of every one. Every one. That's the God I serve. He loved me so much, he's willing to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's what the scripture says. So the Holy Ghost is there for times, for their problems, and even for prayer. When you look at chapter 16, verse 23, it says, And in that day you shall... Uh, ask me nothing, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever or whatsoever you shall ask in my Father's name... I, he will give it you. Now, when you go praying and you pray with the right motive behind it, God in heaven is hearing your prayer. And he grants your needs according to his riches and glory. God ain't never went bankrupt, never could. He'd got, he got gold for walking stones up there. That's amazing. You think about it. The whole, the whole street of heaven is paved with gold. We're going to walk on that. Gates is great big pearl. 
My, what a, what a beauty that place. And, and when, when you think of Jesus, the glory that, that shone or shines round, round about him uh, coming off of those pearls, you can see all the details and the beauty in them pearls plus a, the street of gold. Man, you're talking about a shining place. That's going to be something to see over there. And then folk got crowns. There'll be crowns. People wear. Man, it's going to be beautiful, isn't it? We see the sunset in this life. And we can see some beautiful sights. And can, can you imagine? I, I, I really can't. I try. I try to think on it, but uh, this old feeble mind can't get a grasp on how beautiful heaven is. But they, the emphasis he had here with the comforter, he talks to him about praying. Then he goes in chapter 17, and he gets into praying. Now, Many times we talk about the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, chapter 7. Uh, he gives us the model for praying there. Remember, that is the model to pray. That is not Jesus' prayer. That is not the Lord's Prayer. Chapter 17 in John is the Lord's Prayer. He says, he spake, and these, these words spake Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, he's praying now, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. That's a good verse for you to remember right there. You might want to mark it, underline it, highlight it, or something where it'll stand out for you because that proves to you, on top of some other verses, that Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God when they made the creation. That knocks a lot of old false religions in the head right there. That, that sets apart the religion or the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ from all other religions. Because he wasn't just some feller born through the Virgin Mary, which most won't believe the Virgin. They, they accredit that to some other uh, mishap. But he is, he is the Son of God that was with God. And became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's a good that's a good little verse there, verse five. Verse six says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known all that now that now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and, have, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out of thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, for them which thou hast given me, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All are mine. All mine are thine. And thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So you see the connection here ties us all together with God the Father, God the Son, and all of us as sons and daughters of God. What, a, what an encouragement as the Lord has engaged in prayer. And he goes on in this. There's so much, so much here that we could talk about. And he talks about uh, them being of him and not of the world. And uh, talks about how that he sanctifies them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's the purpose and the power of the word of God is the truth of God to sanctify us. That's to set us apart for service and clean us up for service as the Lord here engages in prayer. He goes through his prayer time and then he heads on into the garden. Verse eight, or chapter 18, verse 1. He goes, he educates them with joy. He emphasizes the comforter. He engages in prayer as they're walking. Gives you, gives you a little something there. You can walk and pray. 
Amen. I, I believe in formal prayer. I believe in bowing your head and closing your eyes. I believe getting on your knees, but I also believe you can drive and, and pray. I have. You can walk and pray. You can work and pray. Praying's of the heart. Not necessarily just words that flows out. Here he prays so they can hear him. You can pray without anybody hearing you. See, God hears the moans of your heart, the tears from your eyes. So it goes on in verse 18, uh, verse 1, chapter 18 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, as he finishes his prayer, when he went forth with his disciples over the brook Chedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. So now they've gone into the garden. He's now entered into the garden of Gethsemane. Now, Luke gives a lot about the garden, and there's, there's good reading, good study there in the book of Luke, chapter number 22. You can read how the Lord enters the garden there in verse number 39. And Luke gives a very good description of the physical anguish and pain that the Lord Jesus goes through. Luke was a doctor, and he gives you a doctor's perspective of it because he speaks of the, the drops of blood, the sweat that became his blood, and that's some very, very profound stress on the body. When you're sweating blood, old country folk use a, use a phrase of sweating bullets. Jesus sweated blood. That's, that's a very fervent prayer as he was there in the garden. I want you to note something in verse number 2. The Bible says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Before reading that right now, how many of you knew that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane more than one time? That there's your proof that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane more than just this one time. Because Judas knew where he would be. He knew that that was a place that he resorted to. He knew that that was a place that he took the disciples, and it was a place, <coughs> excuse me, that he went often. He was much about prayer, folks. The prayer ministry of our Lord and Savior is to be an encouragement for us to be like him in prayer. See, they called us Christians first at Antioch. Because we were Christ-like. That's what Christian means, Christ-like. May God help us to be more like Christ in this area. We need to be more about prayer. There's so much that God does in our hearts and our minds and our lives through prayer. We can access power. We can access guidance. We can access Him, Himself in prayer. It's a place where so much takes place for us and in us is this avenue of prayer. He returns there. Something else I want to show to us here in the book of uh, John about this Garden of Gethsemane. Verse number 12 says that the band of, uh, then the band and the captain of the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Notice that here, here he relinquishes his authority. We talk much about his humiliation, his humility. We talk much about his submission, his surrender, his letting them do. Let me give you a few verses about him letting them. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 verse 11 says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. That's after he had went into the 40 days and 40 nights uh, praying and fasting, and then the temptation the devil brought on him, and then when it was all over, the angels came and ministered unto him. Uh, look, at, uh, look at verse number 19 in chapter 18. And the high priest asked, then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And... Uh, He's, he's went from the garden and he's been brought before the high priest. I want you to notice the high priest is who they brought him to first. What's a priest? That's the religious crowd. 
the religious crowd is the ones that pushed him forward to Pilate. The religious crowd is the ones that wanted him crucified. Why? Because they're religious, not truthful. Just because something comes in the name of religion does not mean it's right. I don't mean to bring confusion or problems, but I do mean to bring truth. The calling of God on my life is to present truth. Truth is what sets us apart. Just because it says church on it, just because it's got a, a doctrine label on it as Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever, that doesn't mean it's right unless it lines up with the truth of God's Word. There's your proofer. That's how you sort things out. That's how you discern things. That's how you know what's really true and what's not. It lines up with your Bible. Now, if you're not settled on this Bible being the truth, then we need to have a little talk about your King James Bible and what it's been through and, and why it is truly the Word of God. I, I, I can answer a lot of that with this. What other one book does everybody else stand against? All the other versions that's out there stand against, together stand against the King James Bible. Then go look and see where they came from, who, who manufactured them, who worked them up, who put the commentary together, whatever. And that'll help you to know that this Bible here is true. It's right. It stood the test of times. It's what was used when our country was founded. It's what was used that gave hope and inspiration to our forefathers that was willing to come and find a place where they could worship the true and the living God because England had went to a corrupt religion. It was a state-controlled religion, not a God-controlled religion. They'd done what they were told to do in their religion there. That's why they left England to come here. But the Lord relinquishes His authority. Let me give you another verse to help you. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 53, Jesus says, Thinkest thou that I can not cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. They've got him captive. They're going to crucify him. He's in their custody as we would know it today. He's wearing the handcuffs. He's controlled by them. And he says, Thinkest that I cannot now call to my father and he'd give me 12 legions of angels? Y'all know what a legion is? According to Webster, a legion is three to 5,000. 3,000 to 5,000 is what a legion is. I, I, I did a little math on that. That's anywhere from 36,000 to 60,000 angels. He could have said, Father, send me some angels. What do you think that bunch is going to do with 36,000 or 60,000 angels that showed up? Now, they ain't got to eat meat and taters to have strength. They don't got to make sure they've took their medicine so they'll be able to fight a long battle. When he calls them angels, they there, they can do something. He said, I can call 12 legions of angels. Again, I want you to remember here, he surrendered his authority. He relinquishes his authority. He lets them do what they're doing. To know the pain and the suffering that they're fixing to put him to and know that all he's got to do is flex or pray. He could have ended it at any moment, but he knew that it was necessary for me, for you and every other sinner that's ever been or ever will be. He had to go through this for us. See, that cross in the middle was the cross they put Christ on, but it should have been a Barabbas that was up there. What's Barabbas represent? Ever lost soul that's ever walked on the face of the earth or will walk. Barabbas is a representative of the old criminal, the the mean, the, the defiled. Jesus took our place on that middle cross. What a walk. This last walk he takes as he, as he enters into their custody, as, as he 
has exited the garden. Chapter 18, verse 19, he's now beginning to encounter, as I read there, the high priest, he's now beginning to encounter the false trial. They put him through a false trial. It's all a made-up, set-up deal. It's a false trial. They got paid witnesses. Read your scriptures. They've got folks set up to testify against him, to lie on purpose against him. That's a false trial. There was no trial. A trial is when you bring forth the facts and the truth. This is no trial. This is, this is a man that's accused, and the witnesses they bring are false witnesses. It's a false trial. He should have never been there. But yet they railed on him. Luke chapter 22 verse 63 says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. Now, if that don't stir something in you, you need some help. If that don't bother you inside to know that these men's got him held and somebody's just a frailing on him, a beating on him, they smote him as a word we'd call uh, to, uh, for a right hook or a left cross. He's standing there defenseless doing nothing and they're beginning to beat on him. He didn't have to stand there and take it, but he did. He went through all of this false trial while they railed on him, while they roughed him up. Matthew 26, 67 said they spit in his face, they buffeted him, and others smote him with, their, with the palms of their hands. You know, the, the movie pictures one guy walks up and smacks him and says, Hey, who am I? Because they got a hood over him. You know, they they done a movie years and years ago, and it shows some guy walks up and smacks him upside the head with a with a hood over him where he couldn't see who it was. And that 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 was the extent of that. That's not the extent, because right here it just told you there's more than one smacking him. Others with an S on it smote him with the palms with an S on it. Of there, there is more than one. Is that right? I'm not an English scholar, so y'all help me out. Don't there mean there's more than one person there? So there's more than one that's popping him, hitting him, smiting him aside the head. Think of the brutal trial that he goes through. They're, they're not even got into good questions yet, and they're beating on him. They've not proven any guilt yet, and they're beating on him. That's why the encounter that Isaiah gives us in chapter 53 shows how that he was beaten beyond recognition. It wasn't just the cat of nine tails on his back. You could take and beat his back with that cat of nine tails, 39 stripes, and still know who he was. But not with the beating they gave his face. He would be on recognition. Smote him, beat on him continually. An innocent man. Our Lord, our Savior. One that come to die for us. And they railed on him. They roughed him up. They rejected him. Verse number 40. They they cried, then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber, the Scripture says. One passage says he was a murderer. He went in and beat somebody to death, stole their money. He's a murderer and a robber. And they said, Hey, we don't want that religious feller. We don't want this Jesus. We want Barabbas to be released. That shows you how corrupt a society can be, and I'm not going into politics tonight. But that just shows you how terribly corrupt people can be and believe they're right in what they're doing. They're deceived by the devil himself. It's a work of the devil. Lying is of the devil. John chapter 8 tells you when somebody's a lying, it's because they influence to the devil. They either influence or, or uh, inflicted by him. He's either inside there or he's trying to talk to them to get them to do it. 
but ever lies of the devil. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's a mess what we, we see that our Lord and our Savior was put through as he encounters this false trial where they railed on him and they roughed him up and they rejected him. <coughs> Can you imagine somebody loving you so much they're willing to die for you and you beat on them with your fist? Watch folks beat him with a whip and drag a hide plum off of him. Tom says he could see his own bones. That cat of nine tails would grab a hoat and snatch the meat right off his flesh, right off his body. This false trials where they do all this harmful, painful beating to our Lord and our Savior. As we think the next few days on the last mile that our Lord and Savior journeyed on his earthly ministry think about what he had on his mind he's headed to his false trial and on the way down the road he's educating his disciples on joy and getting it pinned down so we would have it for us to help us on our our journey he emphasizes that I've, I'm sending a comforter. Though I'm not there, I'll send a comforter. He'll guide you in all truth. He engages in prayer for us. He, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray again. Need to highlight that. I guess we need to look at that a whole lot. Lord done a whole bunch of praying. On this last mile, we've got two different encounters where he's praying. Not my will, Lord, but thine be done. What uh, this, whole, this whole mile, which is all about him being persecuted and, and the pain and the suffering that he'll go through and the whole journey is about us. He wants to educate us so we'll know how to have joy. He, he, wants, to, he wants to help us and, and pray for us. He wants to encourage us that there's a, there's a comforter that's going to help you as you go through it. And then he goes into that garden of Gethsemane. That Gethsemane means wine press. That, that garden Gethsemane, the, word, the root word to Gethsemane means how that they used to put the grapes in the, in the press and they'd, they'd walk them down to where there was nothing left but the juices. That means to be mashed out to where there's nothing left but juice. The Bible says that his sweat became as drops of blood. He was, he was pressed unbearably in the Garden of Gethsemane for us. His last mile. He encounters a false trial, but he enters the final trail in chapter 19. I'll not be able to go through all of chapter 19 for sake of time, but when you get down to verse number 16, it says, Then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus, they led him away. Skipping very much in this passage where they've, they've robed him with, with royalty, to mock him and to make fun of him and to spit in his face. They unrobed him. They put his clothes back on him. Then they strip him naked and hang him before everybody. Just because they could be mean to him. They'd done it with the cruelness of their heart to the darling Lamb of God. The reason he come forth as a lamb the first time was because he come for sacrifice. Lambs are defenseless. They're sacrificial animals. All the lambs about is giving. They give us wool for comfort and for clothing. They give us food. But they give us a sacrifice that satisfies the Father. Jesus came forth as a lamb. They take him into this false trial and they beat on him and they put clothes on him and they snatch clothes off. 
y'all know what it's like to take a big old Band-Aid off? I watched Titus here recently when he laid his leg wide open and they had to put wraps on it and you got to take it off and it's it looks like it's trying to peel it right open again and it it hurts. They put these clothes on him and then they pull them off. And the blood that's coming out of him as it dries a little bit and they begin to peel it back off. Just think of the pain and the agony that Jesus went through. I can't even I can't even come close to describing it right. But the pain that he went through, he did all this for us. He starts out educating these disciples. He, he wants them to know about everything. He encourages them with the Spirit of God. And then he, he willingly enters into a false trial that he knows set up. Now, if I know they got me set up, I'm probably not going to go there. I ain't much for setups. Now, I have. I, I know that. I've done that uh, two times comes to mind. I've, I've entered in knowing that it was set up against me before I ever got there. In both of those occasions, I was trying to help somebody be right with Jesus and be right in church. Usually doesn't turn out too well. It didn't for Jesus and it didn't for me either. So, But doing what's right, doing what's the Lord's will brings joy. He enters this final trail. As the Lord is led up to Calvary's way, they led him away there. It finishes up in verse number 16. They took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Jesus' body is so ricking with pain, suffering. But as he goes on his last walk, his last mile, He's carrying the cross on his back up to Calvary, the cross that they're going to nail him to, hang him up before all mankind and make mockery of him. He's going up through there, and there's a Cyrenian there. Luke chapter 23, verse 26 says, And they led him away, and they laid hold on Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and they, they, they on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. You can dissect that any way you want to, whether he was a help. Some says that he put him at the foot of the cross to carry it to where it put more weight and pressure on Jesus. I don't know. All I know is Cyrenian did not refuse. And I think Cyrenian deserves a good thank you, Cyrenian. Thank you, Simon the Cyrenian. Thank you for helping Jesus. All those other folks stood by. He had healed the blind. Made the lame to walk. Healed a fellow with a withered hand. Made it, restored it whole. Old Simon's mother-in-law was raised up from sickness near, near death. J. Iris' daughter was dead. He raised her up. There's a woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, and she'd spent all she had. Nobody could help her. She got to Jesus. She just touched the hem of his garment. She is made whole. I don't believe there's a problem in her body nowhere when she touched the hem of his. But yet he walks up Calvary's hillside carrying his own cross. And they bed, uh, had Simon to help out to carry the cross up there. Looked like it had been a whole bunch of folk wanting to help him, don't you think? All these folks he's healed. These folks he's raised from the dead. You know that one fellow, they, they had to carry him on a cot, a stretcher, all the way to Jesus and let him down through the roof. And Jesus touched him and healed him. He didn't just heal their bodies. He saved their souls. The little short Zacchaeus made the, made the main page in our King James Bible because uh, Jesus wanted to go home with him and saved his soul, made a change in his life. Look at all the folks that Jesus saved through the years. You know, there's one afternoon, there's a bunch of hungry folks sitting on a hillside. There's 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. Where's those folks at as he's making this last smile walk? You know, us folk have been by the bedside by a lot of our people. 
Because we know we want to be there with them on their last mile. Here goes Jesus up along the hillside. Disciples are forsaken. Some probably hiding in the bushes, others hiding behind buildings. As Jesus is carried up his last mile, Calvary's hillside. He walked his last mile long. Mom and a few others was around. Oh, John. John was there at Calvary's cross. Jesus hung there as the Lord was dying. He said and spoke some of his last words to old John. He said, John, behold thy mother, and mother, behold thy son. And he put a union together there. I believe old John took care of Miss Mary till her dying day. You know, it's important to be there for the last mile. But the most important thing in the last mile, you make it to Calvary. Has there been a time in your life to where you bowed your humble head before the God of heaven and said, God, be merciful, me a sinner? Have you ever been to Calvary in your heart? Realizing Jesus done all this, went through all this, his last mile he walked, he did it just for you. God said, for whosoever, that's anybody's name, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He gives us John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He made this open for whosoever will. He walks up that last mile of his life to go on Calvary's hillside for whosoever will. Have you called on Jesus as your personal Savior? Do you know him? This man that loved you so much that he was willing to go through the utmost of pain and suffering, the worst of mockery that a man could bear, Jesus did just for us. He did it just for you. Do you know this Lord and Savior? as your personal Lord and your personal Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive me for I tried to present the truth of thy word tonight. I don't believe there's a man alive that has the ability to give the description and details in the manner that's necessary to give the honor and glory due to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But thank you for all that try. Pray you'll help us and bless us. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking that lonely walk for me. Thank you for loving me enough to endure all this mockery and the rejection, the pain and the suffering that you went through, to be lied upon, all these, all these things that you suffered. You did it with me in your mind, me on your heart, as well as the others throughout the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us. Help us that we might serve you as you deserve. Forgive us, for you know we're feeble. You know we fail. Forgive us and cleanse us. Use us for your glory. My God, I pray tonight, should there be one here or tuned in with us through the TVs, Lord, whatever. If you've dealt with their heart, I pray that, God, you'll give them the grace, the strength, the encouragement to bow their humble heart before you and say, Lord, be merciful me, a sinner, and save me. Lord, I pray you'll give them that measure of faith that they need, as small as it needs to be. I pray, God, you'll give them the faith they need to trust you as their personal Savior now. I ask you these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we'll deal with a few prayer requests quickly tonight. Uh, Brother Robert mentioned to me that Dennis Church passed away yesterday, I believe you said, last night sometime. So remember, 
uh, Dennis Church's family. Pray the Lord would give them that grace and comfort that they need in these these hours. Uh, God touches young uns and his wife. Give them their help they need. He's a good man. I worked with him a couple of years out at White Sales, around him several different times through life. He's a good man. And uh, he's a helping man. He'd help folk. And I uh, appreciate the Lord letting me know it. But remember them. Pray much for them. Uh, I do want to mention, remember Sunrise 645 this Sunday. Might want to bring your umbrella and uh, bring some bacon and eggs and ham, sausage, or whatever else you might want to fix up for breakfast. We're going to have breakfast after the sunrise. We'll sit around and fellowship until 10 o'clock for Sunday school. Then we'll have the worship hour at 11, and we'll take the evening service off. So uh, remember our plans for this coming Lord's Day and uh, pray. Oftentimes you'll have folks that will come to church uh, for Easter, main events, deal, days like that, Mother's Day, etc., that doesn't normally go. So pray God to help me with the message. Pray God will show up in power and strength and save sinners and strengthen his saints of God. Amen? All right. Other prayer requests we need to mention tonight. Do continue, Miss Nikki. Uh, she's home. Pray the Lord to continue to help her. Remember Miss Karen, and she's healing up. I hadn't went by and bothered her yet, but uh, probably check on her uh, tomorrow. Uh, but uh, just pray that she gets healed up. She had several different things going on as well as her surgery, so pray for her. The Lord would touch and help her. Anything else tonight? Prayer request. Remember Scott? He went and had to visit the ER the other morning, and uh, he's trying to find that thumping gizzard, but uh, there's some waves or something, but we're not sure yet because they had not got another picture of it, so we just, but no, in the seriousness of it, pray. They, uh, they don't know what happened. He had some uh, medical issues going on, not sure what it was or what caused it. Uh, so pray he can get some answers and know what that is and fits it. Amen. It wasn't just plain meanness. It was something else got in there and bothered him. So pray about that, all right? Lift him up. Yes, ma'am. All right, remember her brother and his wife. Yes, sir. Anyone else got a request this evening? Yes, ma'am. Unspoken. Yes. Amen. All right, remember that. Remember Miss Gail? Lord, touch and help her. She's got issues she's dealing with still. Brother Jack, Lord, keep giving him strength and health and ability to get around. Amen. Amen. He's got a need that he's thinking about maybe getting adjusted. Uh, so much prayer there. Yes, ma'am. Pray the Lord's grace be with Brittany and them as they travel. They're going to go see their daddy for a few days. So pray for that little journey. It goes well. Titus will behave. Yeah, take it easy yet. He's, he's, he's healing up and thinking he can go wild. But uh, pray he'll take it easy and let that thing get healed plumb, plumb right. Amen. All right, anyone else? Yeah, she has that macular degenerative, and it's been bothering her a little more lately. So remember Miss Louise Dallinger, lift her up. Uh, remember Fred Shoemaker, they put him in a nursing home. I done that on a call out the other day. Uh, lift, lift him up and uh, pray for Miss Nancy. Uh, Lord, give her the grace that she needs as well. Pray for the youngins as they try to help to do what they can in that situation. And for their little church because they don't have nobody over there. So I don't know what will become of that. That's the beginning grounds for us. Crossroads Baptist Church in the early 70s. And then they later changed it to Hillside. That's where Preacher Joe started out at. 
his first main church building. He was down at the crossroads off of Boulevard for years getting started. All right, anyone else got a request? Remember those that's lost loved ones recently, that God would help them. Uh, remember Chris and his family and uh, uh, the uh, Tucker family, uh, Mike Bowman's family, Harry Lee House family. Remember these folks that's lost loved ones. Well, now it's settled in, and it's 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 real. So um, pray much for them. God give them the grace and comfort they need in these hours. Amen. Anyone else got a request tonight? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Remember Nathan, decisions that he's got to make in the future for his working and stuff, that the Lord would lead him and guide him in the direction he'd have him to go and open the doors and make things easy for him. Amen? Amen. We want him to be successful, do well, but keep God in the middle of it. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to God. Our gracious and heavenly fathers, we bow again.